Hello and welcome to another very entertaining video. As we think about motor movement, I just want to take a second to discuss the idea of proprioception. In perhaps an oversimplification, this is simply the idea that your body knows where you are. Take, for example, the simple idea of blindfolding yourself or closing your eyes and then moving your hands about wildly and then with your eyes still closed, trying to touch the tips of your pointer finger on your right hand and your left hand. As you bring your hands together to touch your fingers, you don't need sight to know where your hands are. That's because your brain knows where they are based on proprioceptors. This is just one example, but a good example that serves the purpose for understanding what proprioception is about. The body knows its location because of a certain proprioceptor in the muscle called the muscle spindle. And the muscle spindle is designed to measure specifically three components of the muscle its overall length, its stretch, and its velocity. In other words, how rapidly it's changing. To better understand how this works, let's take a deep dive into skeletal muscle and discuss how these, how these muscle spindles actually work. We're gonna take this as a random muscle, maybe it's your bicep. We can see the tendons on the end. And we know from previous units that the muscle is composed of individual muscle fibers. A muscle fiber is a single cell, it's multinucleated, the result of multiple embryonic myocytes fusing together to form one long muscle fiber. And we're gonna say these fibers go from end to end. These are force generating fibers and are called extrafusal muscle fibers. And from our previous discussion on the neuromuscular junction, we know that a lower motor neuron can synapse on these extrafusal fibers, delivering an action potential and leading to muscle contraction. This lower motor neuron is an alpha motor neuron. And we highlight that for differences that we'll see in just a minute. Now I'd like to discuss the muscle spindle. In reality, the muscle is full of these tiny little muscle spindles. We're just gonna draw one big one in the middle to highlight how it might work. And we're gonna break it down into two components, a sensory component that we're gonna draw like a spring. And the spring is attached and controlled by a different type of muscle fiber. On both sides, these are intrafusal fibers. And as muscle fibers, they're also innervated by motor neurons. However, this motor neuron is slightly different. This is a gamma motor neuron. So as we look at this, there are two questions that we want to ask ourselves. Number one, how does this device register length, stretch, and velocity and relay that information to the brain? And number two, how does it maintain sensitivity across the full range of motion that this muscle can extend? Well, to visualize that, let's take the muscle above and let's stretch it out. I hope you can notice that by relaxing the extrafusal fibers, which I haven't drawn in this, we can see that the internal component of this muscle spindle has been stretched out. This spring-like apparatus has been stretched out. Now this is important because this is the sensory component of the muscle spindle. It's actually just a modified nerve ending containing lot, lots of mechanically gated channels. These are cation channels, and so I hope you can appreciate that with increased stretch, we get increased cation permeability, and this leads to an increased frequency of action potentials to the brain. This helps answer the first question that we asked about how a muscle spindle can register length and stretch and velocity and all those things, but how can it maintain sensitivity? And to see that, let's now add one of the extrafusal fibers. You'll notice that that extrafusal fiber is physically longer than it was in the flex position. Of course, we understand this, right? The sarcomere has the capacity to contract up to 50% of its total maximal length. Here we've extended these back out, we've stretched it out. What if we also allowed the intrafusal fibers to stretch out? What would that look like? I hope you can see that as we've relaxed the intrafusal fibers, just like we relaxed the extrafusal fibers, this actually allowed the spring, the sensory mechanism in the middle of this muscle spindle to come back to what we would call set point, where it's now sensitive to increased movement. Now, just to drive the point home, let's reverse the process. This time, let's flex the muscle. So here, alpha motor, neuro, alpha motor neurons deliver an action potential through the neuromuscular junction to extrafusal fibers, and these contract, shortening and leading to a flex muscle. Now, what's gonna happen to the muscle spindle? As the muscle length shortens, the muscle spindle also shortens. And because these are stretch receptors, we now have decreased stretch, and that's gonna to lead to a closing of mechanically gated channels and therefore a decrease in action potentials. And this is how the brain registers that this muscle has been compressed. Of course, we want to return our muscle spindle to set point so that it can register further movement. 
And so just like the alpha motor neurons delivering action potentials to extrafusal fibers, now we want gamma motor neurons to deliver an action potential to intrafusal fibers, causing them also to flex. And as these intrafusal fibers shorten, they pull on the sensory component of the muscle spindle, pulling it apart and returning it to its sensitive set point. So hopefully that gives you a basic understanding of A, how muscle spindles are able to relay information to the brain regarding position and length and velocity of muscle movements, and also how innervation of intrafusal fibers, which parallel the movement of the extrafusal fibers, is set up to allow the muscle spindle to adjust and reestablish its sensitive set point following muscle movement.